Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to our citywide psychiatry grand rounds. Uh, I'm Raj Rasasingham, the CPD director for the Department of Psychiatry. And today um, our co-host is the wonderful ChemH team. And I really want to thank them for being here and presenting on this uh, very important topic. Um, couple of, uh, let's start with the uh, land acknowledgement, if you will mind. Um, I would like to begin uh, with an acknowledgement of the land on which we work, study, and live. Before I read it, I want you to take a moment to situate yourself and think about the land under and around you. We recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which the sites of the Department of Psychiatry are located that precede the establishment um, of the University of Toronto. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional treaty of many indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas uh, of the Credit, the Ashinabe, and the Chippewa, and the Hidishinawe and the Wendat people. Today, this land is home to so many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work and gather on these territories. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Since this event is a virtual gathering, a singular land acknowledgement does not capture the richness of our distribution across many locations. There are few places on earth that someone before us has not called home. Thank you for that. As I said, this is going to be a, a presentation on the advances of clinical care for, gen, um, for gender dysphoria. Um, uh, after uh, Dr. Sokolingham does the introduction, I will introduce the speakers formally. The evaluation link will be sent at the end, and we always appreciate your feedback. And we have a next citywide stand rounds at the 27th, and with Dr. Lisa Andam. Okay. Um, without further ado, uh, Matt, you can take take that one now. Um, I want to introduce the Chief Medical Officer for CAMH, uh, who's a co-lead in, in organizing this, this Grand Rounds, um, Dr. Sanjeev Sokolingam. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rasasingham, for uh, introductions. And again, as, as Raj said, I'm a Chief Medical Officer and VP Education at CAMH, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our joint uh, Department of Psychiatry and CAMH uh, citywide rounds and to be hosting the rounds today. Uh, I won't say too, too much just because I know we have such a wonderful presentation from uh, a great group of presenters and panelists uh, for today's presentation. And I think uh, the topic today was one uh, that we selected uh, given the importance of uh, advancing our understanding of gender dysphoria, how care has continued to be transformed in an inclusive and equitable way. And I'll just say, you know, uh, as an organization, CAMH is going through, uh, launched its new strategic plan in advancing care, working upstream and uplifting societal health or, or uh, through mental health justice are our three pillars. And I think this topic I'm, I'm certain we'll cover all of these areas uh, in this uh, in this very robust way. So I wanna thank the presenters in advance um, and uh, welcome all of you to our rounds and I'll hand it back to Dr. Rasa Singham for the formal introductions. Thank you, Dr. Sokolman. Um, and I wanna introduce the, the, the wonderful speakers we, we have today. Um, Dr. Wayne Basie is a staff psychiatrist at the Center of Addiction and Mental Health and the Assistant Professor in, in General and Health Systems a Psychiatry Division at the University of Toronto. He has over a decade of clinical experience in trans and gender diverse healthcare and current medical lead of the CAMA Gender Identity Clinic. He has an interest in medical education and faculty development, including developing and contributing to fellowship education uh, for the departments of psychiatry, family medicine, and endocrinology. And as a past co-lead of the ECHO teams, uh, ECHO strands and gender diverse healthcare programs and LGBTQ2S plus psychiatry faculty mentorship. Um, Dr. June Lam uh, uh, is a psychiatrist um, at the Center uh, of Addiction and Mental Health uh, Gender Clinic in Toronto. Uh, he also has a PhD in clinical epidemiology at the University of Toronto. His thesis is a mixed method study to understand trans and gender diverse people's experience of acute mental health care, hospitalization emergency department visits, and access to post-discharge mental health care. 
His scholarship also includes a focus on teaching and practicing gender affirming care. He's the current co-lead for the Echo Trans and China, uh, Gender Diverse Healthcare Program. Um, and then, so the, those are the, our two speakers. Um, the panelists uh, we have as well is Dr. Kinnan McKinnon, um, is an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at York University. Prior to joining York U, he completed a PhD in uh, public health sciences at Dalai Lama School of Public Health, University of Toronto, and fellowships in health professional education at the Wilson Center, Tertiary Faculty of Medicine, and social work and social determinants of health at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Dr. McKinnon's interdisciplinary scholarship examines how gender diverse people access and experience gender affirming healthcare. The next panelist is Dr. Kate Greenway, uh, a cure family physician who has been providing gender affirmative care as part of her practice for 20 years. She's been a longtime advocate for cure and trans communities and has led changes in provincial health systems and medical training programs to improve quality, improve health quality for 2SLGBTQ plus people. She is medical director of the multi-province virtual gender affirming care program and consultant at CAMA Gender Identity Clinic. She teaches with the ECHO Transgender Diverse Healthcare Program. And lastly, Dr. Gordon McShefley uh, uh, is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist. Um, completed his medical degree at the University of Toronto. He completed his pediatric residency and his ad adolescent medicine fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto. Uh, uh, he practices general adolescent medicine with a focus on gender affirming care, also provides education on gender affirming care to healthcare providers through Project ECHO, Trans, and Gender Diverse Healthcare. So, welcome everyone. To today's presentation. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Uh, Wayne, I think you are in a uh, presenter view. You might have oh. a shared displays there. Yeah. Sure. Okay. How is that? Perfect. All right, well, thank you everyone for welcoming us today for the Citywide Rounds. I'm Wayne Basie, I use he, him pronouns, and we'll be discussing today advances in clinical care for gender dysphoria. And so our learning objectives today is to understand how to diagnose and treat gender dysphoria, considering a historical context, apply an affirming approach to mental health care for trans and gender diverse people, and we will also have a, a, an ability to participate in a panel discussion with a multidisciplinary trans health team, which today includes the field of family medicine, um, pediatrics, and research. And so these are our disclosures and conflict of interest. And so first I wanted to wish everyone a happy Pride Month. Uh, Pride Month starts tomorrow, but why not celebrate one day early uh, for our last uh, citywide rounds of the year. And you can see uh, June and I uh, marching in this parade with uh, some members of the Gender Clinic. And so this year, it will be the last Friday in June, the Trans March, which is the Canada Day long weekend. So I welcome anyone to join us for this important advocacy event. And so we will roughly break up uh, our talk into these three uh, main sections. So I will talk about the diagnosis and treatment of gender dysphoria. So when we consider gender dysphoria, we first need to understand, you know, how many folks are we considering? So fortunately, Canada is the first country to collect and publish data on gender diversity. And as you can see, about one in 300 people in Canada identify as trans or non-binary. When we're looking at the younger cohort, this approximate almost one in 100. And if we're looking at Ontario in general, this equates to almost 40,000 people identify on this census as being under the trans umbrella. But nonetheless, you can see this is still just a sliver of the overall population. And so as we understand uh, the diagnosis, it's important to understand how diagnoses have evolved over time. And so there is no mention of gender identity in our first two editions of the DSM. And it first uh, was noted in the DSM-3 in 1980 as transsexualism. This then evolved to gender identity disorder in 1994. And now it's currently recognized as gender dysphoria in our uh, current DSM. 
And there is a more recent move to use the term gender incongruence, which has been officially recognized by the ICD-11 this 2022. And so part of the reason for the evolution of diagnosis is to reduce stigma. And in fact, with the ICD, they have moved gender incongruence from the chapter of mental and behavioral disorders and into the chapter of conditions related to sexual health. And so these are the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria, a marked incongruence between one experience and expressed gender and assigned gender of at least six months or more manifested by two or more of the following. So I'll let you have a quick look at that. Some of the criteria overlap somewhat. And for gender incongruence, the criteria is also similar. Gender incongruence is characterized by a marked and persistent uh, incongruence between an individual's experienced gender and the assigned sex. And so the main difference between these two diagnoses is that in the DSM, we uh, require that all diagnoses contain clinically significant distress or impairment of functioning as, as part of the diagnosis, where that is not included in the ICD, this impairment um, or distress um, criterion. And so how do I uh, confirm a diagnosis of gender dysphoria in my everyday practice? Well, I perform a general psychiatric interview and I embed within it taking a gender history. As such, I'll ask a person to help me understand their current gender identity, for instance, their correct name and correct pronouns. I will ask a person to tell me their story and history of gender identity and expression across time. For instance, were there any childhood antecedents? How did they react to the physical changes of puberty at that time? Um, how has their journey of exploration evolved to the current understanding of their gender? Have they undergone any social or medical transition? What has that been like? Have they had any discrimination, prejudice, or violence? What is it currently like to live in their physical body? What feels comfortable? What needs to change? And ultimately, what is it their goal for today's appointment, gender related or otherwise, so that I as a healthcare professional can help them grow and uh, lead a true and authentic life? And so as we move into the treatment of gender dysphoria, we broadly classify this with social transition and medical transition. And June will also speak to us about treating any co-occurring mental health conditions should that um, occur. And so these are some examples of social transition, but just a, a, a brief list, such as changing your expression, pronoun usage, coming out to family and friends, name, name change, gender marker change, peer support. In medical transition, we broadly define as either a gender affirming hormone therapy and or transition related surgeries. And so my talk will focus a bit more on the surgeries as that is what historically the gender clinic has helped people move forward with. But for more information, please reach out to the websites Rainbow Health Ontario and Sherwin Health Centre who are partners with CAMH. And so to give us an example of what surgeries are covered in Ontario, these are the surgeries and broadly they're classified as top surgery, gonadal surgery, and genital surgery. And as you can see here, there's some asterisks here, especially with the top surgery, is that there are out-of-pocket expenses and significant restrictions in terms of getting access to funding. For instance, for top surgery, Chest contouring is not a covered benefit as it is considered cosmetic in our province and thus this can cost folks a minimum of $1,800 if they, if they don't have their own private health benefit. So I see this as a, a significant barrier in expense. And here are procedures not covered in Ontario and I wanted to highlight also hair removal as being I think a necessary and important part for, for many transgender folks. So I wanted to give you an example of, you know, what surgeries are being recommended. So this is our data from the last fiscal year of the surgeries we applied for funding for to the Ministry of Health. So the total number is 245 that we submitted last year. And as you can see, about half of it is related to the top surgery, uh, double mastectomy. Then a quarter is related to vaginoplasty. And then we have uh, a little over 10% in terms of the gonadal surgery hysterectomy. 
and then we have other genital surgery, and then we have breast augmentation. It's 0% of the pie, but we help one person move forward with that treatment. But again, the criteria is very restrictive in terms of getting uh, OHIP funding. And so how do we help uh, make the correct decision with a person with respect to access to care? Well, the WPATH, which stands for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, has published criteria to guide our care. And so the recent edition came out this 2022, the Standards of Care 8. Um, the last version is 2012, Standards of Care 7, that was published 14 years ago. And currently the Ministry of Health requires uh, the, the 2012 criterion to be met. So what are the differences with the criteria? Well, as I discussed earlier, uh, now there's more of a focus towards gender incongruence as opposed to gender dysphoria, again, to use depathologizing language. Uh, now only one letter of recommendation is required for gonadal or genital surgeries, whereas previously two letters were required. Now uh, six months of hormone treatment is required for gonadal or genital surgeries, whereas previously this required 12 months. And currently there is uh, no condition to have a, a social transition, whereas previously that was a necessity for 12 months. And so here at CAMH, when these guidelines were published in uh, September of 2022, we wrote a letter of advocacy to the Ministry of Health uh, later that March, uh, advocating for the ministry to adopt the current standards of care eight as part of their funding requirements. And in fact, over a dozen organizations across the province signed off on this letter as well, including three hospital sites who uh, are attending today's talk outside of CAMH. And this is the uh, direction and uh, recommendation from our clinic is to move away from a paternalistic care model towards greater patient autonomy. And so we have published a paper in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry regarding mental readiness and gatekeeping in trans health care. And it is our um, recommendation consistent with WPATH that clinicians shift from a gatekeeping model towards an informed consent model to improve access to care. And so this is where that historical context really plays in. And uh, I wanted to let everyone know that, you know, transition related surgery was not a, bun uh, not a benefit from OHIP for a decade between 1998 to 2008. And in fact, I worked as a resident providing trans health care in 20, uh, 2006 at Mount Sinai Hospital. And we would do similar assessments, but the person would need to pay out of pocket for their surgery. Fortunately, there was a change in 2008 um, to relist uh, the surgeries, but this was under the condition that CAMH was the sole assessment site for OHIP funded transition related surgery. And that was a significant barrier from my uh, point of view with uh, increasingly long wait lists. And we'll see this on the graph to follow. And um, fortunately, as of March of 2016, uh, any healthcare provider can provide surgery referrals, uh, which include any doctor or nurse practitioner. So let's look at the data in terms of referral data to our clinic since um, surgery has been relisted as a benefit uh, under OHIP. So this is data from 2009 up until uh, 2024. And you can see the increase in referrals to our clinic uh, until the 2016 regulation change, which was unsustainable as a clinic. And incidentally, Newfoundland also had the same legislative um, requirements where people in Newfoundland had to fly out to CAMH to do these surgery assessments. And thank goodness we were able to support Newfoundland to change that regulation just before the pandemic hit. And so I'm proud to say that CAMH is a partner with many organizations to provide uh, quality of care. And that's why we have our panelist discussion here as well, as this is a multi-discipline and multi-field multi of medicine uh, treatment. So we have Sherburne Health, which is our primary care experts and hormone experts. We have Rainbow Health Ontario, which provides educational support for both families and healthcare providers and patients. We have our community members and we have Women's College Hospital, which had launched their uh, transition-related surgery program in 2019. And they are also considering 
um, starting a gender affirming medical clinic in its early discussion phases because access to hormone treatment is becoming increasingly difficult in the community. And so I wanted to alert us about what does our Canadian Psychiatric Association uh, position paper or position statements on this matter. And so this was recently updated in 2023 regarding the mental health care for the queer community. And I will highlight one of the statements which has uh, used one of our papers as a reference, which states that the CPA recognizes the efficacy, benefit and medical necessity of gender transition treatments. And, and so I obviously strongly endorse that statement. And also equally as important is um, Ontario Health has now developed uh, quality standards that are currently in their draft, draft form published this past April, 2024. In fact, uh, June and Kate both sat on this committee and I was able to meet with Ontario Health with the OMA earlier this month to review these standards of care. So quality standards outline what high quality care looks like, especially when there is large variation or large gaps in the care provided in Ontario. And so I wanted to highlight two of uh, the standout points of this paper, and this is readily available online, the draft, the draft forms. And one, it specifies that the model of having specialized uh, sexual health centers providing gender affirming care is outdated. This results in limited capacity, long wait lists, delays in treatments, and other barriers. Also, it states in these quality standards that a mental health or substance use concern should not prevent a person from moving forward with gender affirming care, um, and that these should be uh, treated concurrently, um, unless obviously the capacity to provide informed consent is impaired. And so I understand today that we have uh, the entire Department of Psychiatry joining up to 20 uh, hospital sites and organizations attending as well. And so I want you to consider, you know, at your organization or as a department, how are we, you know, moving forward with these high quality standards in terms of providing gender affirming care? It is my impression that you as experienced clinicians, you are familiar with complexity you are well positioned to provide this care as you know your patients well. With appropriate training and education, gender affirming care can become a competency within our department and across our organization. But I understand that uh, I'm sure everyone is exhausted coming out of the pandemic, especially as a healthcare provider. I'm sure all clinics across the organization are seeing increase in mental health needs. And I think some might be thinking, I just can't do this. This is outside of my scope of training. I worry about making the wrong decision. I worry about doing harm. And ultimately, I worry about the risk of regret. It is my clinical and professional opinion that all trans and gender diverse people deserve care, compassion, and understanding at any and all stages of their journey. As such, I am proud to have June Lamb continue this discussion as he is leading research with Kinnan McKinnon to provide us with more insight into this matter. June. Thanks, Wayne. So, um, yes, yeah, so as, as Dr. Basie said, um, I think sometimes, I'm sure many of you have heard the word detransition, and it's, it's a, a concept um, that has been used to sort of prevent uh, gender affirming care in certain settings across the world. Um, and so I think it's important that we address this, uh, this concept. So first of all, there's not a consistent definition for what detransition, how to, how to define detransition, because it's a relatively uh, newly uh, studied uh, area. So here, though, we offer a couple of definitions uh, based on the literature and based on some, you know, expert consensus from some of the people who do research on this, on this area. So discontinuation is the idea of stopping medical treatment for uh, gender transition, but that person is still maintaining a, a trans or gender diverse, uh, their gen uh, gender diverse identity. Detransition, um, on, on the other hand, refers to stopping shifting or reversing a gender transition, plus a shift in that person's identity, gender or sexual orientation. And it's important to highlight that these two concepts are not the same as regret. There is some overlap, 
some of the folks who detransition do have regret, uh, but not all of them. And, um, you know, many people who do detransition um, talk about how it was part of their, you know, gender journey to do so and, and may not necessarily have regret or they were satisfied with the treatment that they received. So what, just a review of what is known about uh, discontinuation and detransition. First of all, not a lot because it's a, like I said, it's a relatively new field. Um, but based on the literature currently, detransition follows gender affirming medical treatments at the rate of between, you know, one to up to 10%. Um, being, and this uh, concept of detransition is being instrumentalized in anti-trans politics to ban or restrict gender affirming care. Um, exploratory studies on detransition show that the majority of the people who have this experience are assigned female at birth. The majority are youth or young adults below the age of 29. And they have a, a diverse heterogeneous uh, identity in terms of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Many of them, however, re do report still being a sexual and gender minority after detransition. Um, and the diverse gender identities can include a lot of non-binary identities uh, listed there. When detransition does occur, it's, it seems to happen several years after the initial transition between you know, 1.5 to 8.5 years. And we know that detransition right now is a very stigmatized experience. People who have a detransition experience experience a lot of social rejection and alienation, have a lot of unmet care needs and, and few formal supports. And uh, the CAST review, which is a UK uh, review that came out recently, which we're gonna talk about because we received a question about it, um, uh, highlights uh, a need for, uh, uh, for further research in this area. So, in speaking of further research, Dr. Kinnan, McKinnon, who is a part of our panel today, is leading um, a study, the largest Canadian study uh, on detransition thus far, um, which is a mixed method study starting with a survey, um, which was taken by almost a thousand people who, who had a uh, detransition experience. Um, and we're, we're following that up with um, a qualitative study to interview some of these folks to understand different you know, pathways and subtypes you know, reasons for discontinuation and detransition and how to support these folks moving forward. So, um, so now we're gonna shift, shift gears a little bit. You know, we spoke a little bit about treatment of gender dysphoria and, um, and you know, uh, folks' gender journeys. And now we're gonna shift into how to support the mental health needs of trans and gender diverse people more broadly. So why is this important? Well, as you may know, um, trans and gender diverse people have very, very increased, you know, very much increased rates of mental illness. So in a trans pulse study, it was found that 43% of trans Ontarians attempted suicide, which is 10 times the um, lifetime suicide attempt rate in the general Canadian population. And similarly, you know, 60, over 60% um, had active symptoms of depression, which is again, much higher than in the general uh, Canadian population. But it's really important to consider where this excess uh, mental illness burden comes from. So for um, uh, trans and gender diverse people, we're gonna focus on the two you know, main sources of uh, mental distress that are you know, in excess of the general population. So first we'll talk about gender dysphoria. Dr. Basie already talked about you know, how to treat gender dysphoria. Here, I'm just gonna add to sort of why that's so important. And one of that is because gender dysphoria really underlies a lot of the mental distress that trans and gender diverse people uh, describe and experience. So there's uh, literature to suggest that medical transition uh, to treat gender dysphoria improves mental health. So hormone therapy, for example, increases quality of life, decreases depression and anxiety. Um, and folks who have access to uh, hormone therapy were half as likely to have seriously considered suicide. For gender affirming surgeries, uh, trans and gender diverse people who have had gender affirming surgeries that they want have higher levels of satisfaction um, with outcomes, improved psychosocial and sexual well being. And importantly, while waiting, while planning, but waiting for gender affirming surgery, that's actually the highest um, time period for risk of suicide attempts. And there is uh, a noted reduction in suicidality after people are able to access gender affirming surgeries. So the second main source of mental distress for trans and gender diverse people that I wanna highlight is minority stress. So minority stress is 
um, just the idea that um, not because of a trans person being who they are, you know, that's not the source of the mental distress, but it's really the world around them that is transphobic, that marginalizes trans people, that leads to a lot of negative social outcomes that I'll talk about some more, you know, that source of systemic and societal discrimination, that's what causes ex excess mental health uh, burden in trans people as well. Some examples of that uh, in society include um, many trans people not being able to, you know, have the correct name and pronoun on their academic transcripts, um, not being able to um, change their sex designation, partly because there's a cost associated with, with that to change their legal ID. Um, many have been uh, physically or sexually assaulted for being trans. Many were fired um, or not hired for, for being trans. Uh, many similarly are not um, giving, uh, given housing resources or uh, you know many people who will not be rented to related to their trans identity. And within, even within the healthcare system, uh, even within emergency departments, many trans people have reported having their care stopped or denied because of their identity. So talking about suicide risk, you know, how, what are some ways from the literature that we can kind of reduce suicide risk for this population? Something that's really important is creating gender affirming clinical spaces. You know, it's been associated with a huge reduction uh, in suicide attempts with less experiences of transphobia. And we'll talk a lot about what that means by, you know, to create gender affirming clinical spaces that we work in. Physicians, I always encourage physicians to write letters to support gender marker, legal gender marker change, because that's been associated with a huge reduction in suicide attempts uh, in the literature. And any physician can write this letter, and it's a very simple letter. And you can email me if you want a template on how to do that. Um, and and uh, educating and working with uh, family, chosen family, if the patient wants, is really helpful, particularly for young people, um, to educate you know the family on on how to support their, their loved ones, it can be really helpful in reducing suicidality as well. So one, one paper that I always like to highlight is this one, where um, you know, for young people who are trans and gender diverse, the more settings that um, they feel that you know, their chosen name is being used, they're, you know, they're gendered correctly, like you know, home, school, peer settings, other environments, the more settings that they are affirmed in their gender, the less um, risk they have of depression and suicidality. And so that's why I think creating gender affirming clinical spaces can be one uh, you know, easy but important way to help address uh, trans people's uh, mental health needs. So this is a figure, a model from my qualitative research where I interviewed uh, trans and gender diverse people with experience of presenting to the emergency department for acute psychiatric care. And they talked about um, what contributed to their, their need for acute care. So on the left, the little blue box, um, a lot of the trans folks talked about minority stress experiences that led to uh, mental distress and suicidality. So it starts often with developmental trauma, which is you know uh, trauma within their family of origin. Uh, many people felt that um, their uh, family did not support their gender identity. And several people talked about actually when they came out to their family, they were actually kicked out. So that led to a, uh, an early loss of housing stability. Um, there's a huge overlap between neurodivergence and uh, gender uh, diversity. Um, you know, 10 to 20 percent of gender diverse people uh, are neurodivergent, you know, having ADHD or being autistic. Uh, and clinically in our gender clinic, that number may be uh, much higher. So many of the trans people talked about um, being neurodivergent, but not having their needs uh, recognized, not having the diagnosis, not having the treatment and supports and accommodations that they needed growing up, and then in school and in, uh, you know, and in their adult life as well. And that definitely contributed to their acute needs and distress as well. Relatedly, um, gender diverse people also have increased rates of physical disability and physical illness. Um, related to minority stress. So you can imagine that minority stress, you know, being misgendered every day can lead to uh, increased uh, chronic stress, uh, and which is well studied in the literature. And that has led to increased rates of chronic illness, a lot of autoimmune diseases, a lot of, um, uh, you know, other, other you know, heart disease, uh, um, uh, fibromyalgia, Ehlers-Danlos, um, IBS, uh, asthma, so uh, that all, all, and then a lot of, so a lot of these illnesses are also um, 
um, newer or less studied or don't have definitive testing like POTS, for example, P-O-T-S. And so um, that for some of the participants, um, they talked about going to the healthcare provider and having their experience invalidated. So that's another source of invalidation that many of the gender diverse people um, experience that contributed to their distress. Um, and then finally, marginalization, which we've already talked about, but you know, being a, a trans person in the world, again, you know, not being hired, you know, being fired perhaps for their gender identity um, after they transition, um, not, you know, not being able to work in the fields that they used to work in, not, you know, uh, experiencing housing and financial precarity, all of those things, of course, contribute to mental distress. And then if you look at the red and orange arrows at the top, um, trans people talk about trying to access care, but either they had to wait for care uh, with long wait lists or not knowing how to navigate care, or because they face a lot of financial precarity, um, uh, a lot of folks are not able to afford private mental health care. And so that's another reason why they've had to wait uh, a long time for care or not be able to access care. And when they are able to access outpatient care, um, often they find it fragmented. Um, it's not holistic. It doesn't, it's not uh, neurodiverse, uh, diversity affirming. Um, you know, they, it's not tr uh, trans affirming. And so they feel like they've had to fragment their, their care, um, even if, if when they're able to uh, access care. And so all of these barriers lead to increasing distress and ultimately, which is that red little square circle, uh, which ultimately leads to the emergency department, which is this, you know, CAMH purple uh, cross there, um, leads to presenting to the emergency department as one of few doorways to being able to access care that they need. Um, once they're in the hospital, in either just in the eMERGE or admitted to hospital, um, that what happens in that experience really impacts their subsequent uh, journey afterwards. So how safe was that experience for them? How useful was that experience? Um, and how much agency did they have um, both going to the hospital and also in the hospital uh, itself? So after discharge, that leads to three different pathways, um, excuse me, three different pathways after discharge. So if you can see the red arrow going up, for some people, the hospital experience was actually more distressing. And so for some of the participants, it led to them avoiding the mental health system altogether. Um, for some people, uh, going to that purple circle, um, they, found that, uh, they found that they would prefer the community-based experiences where often, you know, community, help, uh, community organizations are peer-led, you know, people led by people who are queer and trans themselves, um, and they're explicit about that, um, less hierarchical, less stigmatizing, you know, more recovery oriented. And that model for many of the participants was better than sort of the biomedical systems that we practice in. And then for some people, they did find the uh, acute care experience um, helpful for, for them uh, to some degree. And so they did, and, and that experience actually did facilitate post-discharge care in our systems uh, for some of those participants. So how do, how do these you know, findings in this literature inform kind of um, gender affirming mental health care recommendations? So for our individual clinician patient relationships, you know, um, we encourage using a strength-based ap approach to not, you know, compound the pathologizing approach that many trans people have experienced in their life. Um, to be transparent if we're asking questions, you know, like a lot of times it's not relevant to ask questions about whether they've had gender affirming surgeries, you know, such as in the emergency department uh, necessarily, for example. So if we do ask questions, I think it's important to be transparent about why we're asking these questions. If we misgender somebody or make a mistake, uh, you know, just apologize and move forward and, and, and try to do better uh, next time. And then sometimes using symbols of allyship can be helpful. Having a trans flag, you know, uh, in introducing your own pronouns. Those can be, you know, ways to uh, off uh, offer some inclusive care. And then at the institutional level, I always encourage us to think about, you know, our staff in our clinical setting. Do they represent the population we're serving? How do we measure, you know, outcomes and access? You know, who's not, who is not getting in the front door? Um, I always like to ask. Um, and then, and then, as Dr. Basie uh, said earlier, I think it's always, you know, important to continue to educate ourselves and our team through the many resources that do exist. Um, and then other, other uh, suggestions. So, you know, I think my study and other studies before mine have highlighted the importance of social support, especially when our, a lot of trans people's family of origins um, are not supportive necessarily. Uh, connecting them to community is really, really important. So that should be, you know, a central part of how we support trans folks who we do end up seeing. Validating the dialectic is important. So affirming their experience of oppression and marginalization, it's very real. And 
supporting their capacity for change at the same time, you know, that, that they live in a transphobic world, unfortunately, but, but they have the capacity to make changes themselves as well. Um, offering resources that, that incorporate um, skills to deal with minority stress, such as, you know, affirmative DPT, uh, and uh, uh, at our clinic, we're offering uh, transcending CBT, which is, includes minority stress into CBT and DBT models. Uh, and again, addressing social determinants of care, uh, uh, social determinants of health as a central part of care is particularly important for this uh, population. So just we just wanted to highlight again that in this CPA position paper, that they also highlight the importance of addressing social determinants of health for trans and queer people because uh, you know, they are often disproportionately affected by social determinants of health issues. And again, they cite uh, some of our work uh, for this recommendation. So the last couple of things I wanted to talk about is in the eMERGE setting and in the inpatient setting. So in the emergency department setting, what can we do to improve, you know, the uh, our trans uh, patients' experiences in the eMERGE? So, you know, in addition to everything we talked about earlier, it's important to you know, think about uh, gender affirming language and all the places that, um, you know, uh, that can be lost in terms of, you know, a person's chosen name and pronouns. So making sure the EMR reflects pronouns and chosen name, uh, handover, registration forms, how do we, uh, you know, tie up all of those uh, areas where they, um, we can miss somebody's chosen name and pronouns. Practicing cultural humility, identifying and reflecting on our own biases is particularly important here. Um, the need for confidential environment, it's difficult in the emergency department, um, I understand, but I think if, if it's at all possible, really prioritizing that, especially, you know, for a trans person who may not be out or, or may not feel comfortable sharing all their details, uh, you know, in a more public setting, confidential environments are very important. Engaging a patient's chosen family, so often in the eMERGE, which I work at in the at CAMH, we, we often, you know, prioritize biological family, uh, people's chosen family members. Uh, people's biological family members, rather. Um, but, you know, based on my study, you know, people talk about, you're, you're asking a biological family members to participate in my care, and these are the same people who have harmed me in the past, you know, so perhaps engaging chosen family, people who they consider their family would be really important. Prioritizing agency and autonomy, that's consistent with trauma-informed care broadly, but for this population who've experienced a lot of agency taken away from them, this is particularly important. And again, connecting trans people to, you know, specific trans specific crisis and community resources in the eMERGE uh, and post discharge is really important. The last uh, set of recommendations are for the inpatient psychiatric setting. So again, using chosen names and pronouns, but again, across different um, areas. So uh, a lot of participants talk about their meal trays are not, don't have their chosen name, you know, or their wristband has a big F, you know, uh, for female when they, you know, when that is not consistent with their gender. These things really matter to a lot of trans uh, patients. Uh, training our staff and clinicians on minority stress, prioritizing neurodiversity affirming care because so many of our trans uh, folks are neurodivergent. Um, and then think about our inpatient care policy. So is it possible to assign rooms by gender rather than birth sex? Um, allowing for expressions of gender, you know, uh, when, when it's safe to do so. Um, like clothing, uh, bind, letting people use clothing uh, that's affirming, binders, gaps, uh, et cetera. Uh, continuing hormone therapy and not stopping it, you know, when that's really important to a lot of trans folks in the inpatient setting. Uh, and then again, when they're, when you're discharging people, focusing on social determinants, connecting to community, uh, and trying to integrate our mental health services into community organizations where trans people feel are they're safer and more able to access care is something that we can really, I think, think about uh, in order to improve access to care for trans folks. So last thing I'll talk about very briefly is um, ECHO, which is a virtual program that all clinicians across Ontario can join. Um, and Dr. Greenaway and Dr. McSheffrey are on, uh, are, are on the hub planning team as well. Um, so this is a 16 week program course uh, that, um, that has been, uh, it's now in its eighth, eighth year. And we have, um, uh, next slide please. We have trained over 450 participants through uh, seven years so far, over 300 organizations. You can see all the different uh, types of practitioners, including psychiatrists, family doctors, um, nurse practitioners, and a, a lot of other care providers. And um, next slide please, across all, um, you know, the entire province. Um, and you can see that after 16 weeks, um, you, uh, the, the self-efficacy that the clinicians um, reported uh, doubled. So their confidence and their competence in providing trans care 
uh, doubled after this training. So if you're interested in learning more, which we hope that this presentation has you know, invited you to do so, um, please consider joining either our ECHO or learning through the other resources. And a lot of the community resources that are available are at the end of this presentation, which you'll get a PDF of. So that is our whirlwind uh, presentation. And now I'll turn it back to Dr. Bates. Okay, great. So we'll jump right into the panel discussion. And I see there's already a number of questions in the chat. And so I just wanted to remind folks that we have uh, Kinnan McKinnon with respect to research, Kate Greenaway with respect to um, primary care, and Gordon McSheffrey as well with pediatrics. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And so I'm hopeful that we can all see each other right now. And actually, we did get one question in advance of uh, today's talk. So I'm going to introduce this question and uh, we'll res respond. And I just paraphrased or, or, or edited just for, for brevity. And so the person asked, I read the objectives and I wonder if there will be any discussion about the CAS review that was completed in the UK in April, which has some significant conclusions about the evidence with respect to gender affirming care. I am sensitive to how uh, provocative this entire topic is, but despite this, in order to have a proper discussion as well as a thorough review of the evidence, it would seem to be a significant oversight if the CAST review is not brought up during this discussion. So I'll leave this to start to introduce the CAST report to uh, Kenan, who's leading for research today. Thank you, Dr. Basie and Lam, uh, for a great presentation. Um, yeah, so I think despite uh, progress in our field, we are going through some growing pains with respect to pediatric care. Um, and the CAST review was a, a four-year investigation into pediatric gender-affirming health care in the UK, and it was underpinned by eight systematic reviews of the evidence as well as care guidelines in this area. Um, it was led by Dr. Hilary Cass, who's the former president of the Royal Society of Pediatrics and Child Health. And um, I think off the top first, you know, despite the political response, um, the Cass Review did not endorse bans on pediatric gender affirming health care. I think that's important to point out. Um, it did, however, raise some questions around the evidence base, some uncertainty, especially around research design and some of the ways that the studies have been designed, um, difficulty in discerning risk to benefit ratio. Um, and she also raised some important questions that um, we in Canada can really use to enhance our program of research here. Um, she recommended some caution around prescribing hormonal treatments in minors. Um, but the CAS review was relevant to pediatric care, not to adult care. So I think I'll leave it at there at that and 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 we can move on. Okay, any other points from our discussions? I mean, if it's okay with you, Kate, I'm happy to weigh in from the pediatric perspective. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think, Dr. McKinnon has outlined sort of the CAS report and, and um, some of its recommendations specifically for pediatric care. Um, certainly part of the, there are aspects of the report I think are, are quite valid and there are as recommendations that I would agree with in terms of, you know, dedicated research programs. Um, some, of the, some of the recommendations of course are very specific to the UK context, which we have to take care in generalizing to Canada and our own context and the way our healthcare system runs. But um, certainly CAST in some ways was advocating for more research, um, more care centers, earlier intervention for pre-pubertal -pu children, not necessarily medical because that's already not recommended by all of the world guidelines, but more in terms of connecting families with the system and providing a more longitudinal experience. Um, I certainly had some concerns about what I consider to be fundamental conceptual flaws in some of the, the elements of the report um, in terms of one example would be at one point Cass is saying we have to consider the increase in referrals of gender dysphoria in the context of increases in eating disorders and body dysmorphic disorder, um, which I think is, is quite flawed and inappropriate in terms of um, I don't think gender dysphoria and gender diversity um, 
are are similar to those and I think fundamentally different. I think that speaks to the fact that Dr. Cass did not have experience with gender care prior to the report. And while that was seen as um, trying to reduce bias, I think it, I, in fact, I think it introduced another form of bias. Um, so that's uh, very concerning. And then my final point would be, um, you know, some of the recommendations I think are unethical and are could be quite harmful. Like for example, one of the recommendations is that puberty blockers only be used in the context of a research protocol, um, which I think um, while bans are not specifically recommended as Dr. McKinnon said, that is a type of ban. And there is emerging evidence that bans cause psychological harm, not only to the, the youth, but also to their family um, and, and the broader community. Um, I think uh, coercing people to, to engage in research as a way that they, the only way that they can obtain that medical treatment, I think is profoundly unethical. So um, parts, yes, it's, there's a lot of, of nuance and detail and conflict around the report. And there are certainly positive aspects and a lot of very concerning aspects. Um, and it's gonna be challenging, I think, to, to frame that report where it should be framed in, in the ongoing discussion. Okay, thank you, Gordon. So let me go to the uh, webinar chat first. And so one question is, do you think that needing to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria in order to receive gender affirming care contributes to stigmatization and are there better alternatives? So yes, that would be my concern. And that is, uh, you know, the move with diagnosis is to shift towards less pathologizing language. And for instance, gender incongruence versus gender dysphoria. So usually in my report, I might document that, yes, this person is experiencing gender dysphoria, and this is what we can do to reduce that and to support the person. Um, but are there better, better models of care that is, you know, certainly I'd want to destigmatize and depathologize as much as possible. And here's a second question here in the chat. Thank you for the presentation. I'm a psychiatrist who cares for several people who are trans who have mood, anxiety, trauma-related disorders. I worry that I will not have the time to fully address their needs during the appointment. Yes, I understand that. I appreciate, collabor I appreciate collaborating with specialists in gender dysphoria who give comprehensive care um, uh, recommendations. If you recommend that general psychiatrists take a larger role in trans care, what would that look like? And so I think this is a discussion for the department uh, uh, on the whole, right? What will it look like in terms of um, helping treat, um, you know, up to 40,000 folks get um, the right access to care. But I wonder if any panelists um, have some ideas about this. Um, I know also, Kate, you've been always, you know, looking for improving ways to access care. I wonder what your sense is, is, is in general, like how can our department increase access to care and do it safely, given all of our work demands? Yes, thanks, Wayne. This is a particular area of interest to me. And I think um, actually June identified a number of recommendations that do speak to this topic in terms of um, gender affirming care is not only transition related care, like it's not just hormones and referring for surgery. In fact, the bulk of gender affirming care is actually creating an environment that's affirming and safe for someone to talk about their identity. So I think that's something every clinician should be endeavoring to do in their practice. Um, I also have spent a lot of time in my career trying to debunk that there's a particular expertise or like secrets we know that can help us assess people's gender identities. Um, as family physicians and as psychiatrists, we are all taught to take a gender history, like we, we know how to, or, or a history in general, um, and we can all implement that in our practices. And so I think that is something to, to think about that we have that capacity to do it. Um, and, you know, if if we don't feel we have the particular expertise around hormones and surgeries and we need to liaise with our colleagues, that's also a possibility, right? We can connect to our group here and with ECHO and just uh, with people who will support you on that. Um, and again, one of June's recommendations about decreasing suicidality and mental health concerns, even just taking on writing a gender marker change support for your patients, which has to be done by a physician in Ontario, which is a barrier I'm not terribly fond of. Um, but if you are able to take that on and just provide a, a letter, which has a template that we have, but also uh, Rainbow Health has a template on their website, and you can use this for your patients. 
Great, thank you, Kate. And I just wanted to go to the Q&A section of the chat and I see some of them are answered. So just one that I wanted to highlight is, um, the question was any idea when the Ministry of Health will stop requiring two assessments for bottom surgeries? And so I have uh, no updates on this and that, that would be a tremendous improvement in terms of access of, uh, to care to have one assessor. And then obviously if people need two assessors, you're always welcome to make a referral for a second opinion. And so here's one that I certainly wanna highlight as well. And so anyone can please um, answer this question. Could you please address overlap between gender incongruence and autism? And then the secondary question, gender incongruence with borderline personality disorder. And so I wonder, um, I think this is open to any mem member on the panel. Well, I, maybe if I could maybe start. Um, we know that there is an overlap between um, gender diversity and being on the autism spectrum or being neurodiverse. Um, I think approximately 40% of individuals who identify as gender diverse will also identify as neurodiverse. Um, and I'm not sure we fully or completely understand why there is this profound overlap or, or what contributes to it. Um, I think the key point to take away is, you know, whenever we're, in, well, with any individual we're interacting with, we should come with a trauma-informed approach and with a respect and compassion for all forms of diversity, whether they're gender diverse or neurodiverse. And if I can just add, I think importantly, you know, just because somebody is neurodivergent does not mean that they don't have the capacity or that, you know, that we should, you know, uh, not facilitate access to gender affirming care. There's uh, sort of no evidence for that necessarily. I'm going to pick up one more from the uh, Q&A. Uh, so the WPATH wants to move from paternalistic approach to more autonomy. And um, but then there's a sentence about appropriately evaluated, who is evaluating and on what basis is this to be determined? And so in terms of in Ontario, who can evaluate a person for suitability for surgery? That's any uh, doctor, uh, MD, as well as nurse practitioner. And there's WPATH criteria, which set out uh, different criteria for, for different surgeries on what uh, would be a suitable candidate. And so I'm just looking at the time, it's 12.59. I think we got through a lot of content today. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please reach out to Anne-Marie also, and I'll have maybe, if Raj wanted to jump in for the last few moments, thank you everyone for inviting us. Happy Pride Month. Thank you to my panelists today also. Yeah, happy Pride Month as well. Really want to thank, um, uh, June, Wayne, uh, Kinnan, Kate, and Gordon. It was a really a, a wonderful discussion and very thoughtful. And 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 there's so many different uh, points of uh, that you covered. You know, I know it's a, a restricted period of time, but you did cover a lot. Um, and and I June answered a lot of the questions um, as well. So I know if you have any further questions, if feel free to reach out to Anne Marie, and she will. Um, you know, send it to our speakers uh, for further follow up. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Sokolingham um, for uh, the planning support as well as Anne Marie and I AV team. Um, it's an amazing topic, and and thank you for uh, uh, you know allowing us to uh, talk about this uh, at our citywide psychiatric conference. Sanjeev, do you want to say a last couple of words before we end? Just uh, a thank you to all of our our presenters and panelists. Uh, as you can see, there was high, high engagement and a lot of questions and probably continued dialogue. Uh, so really a need for uh, continued uh, education and awareness on this topic. So thank you for taking the time to do this today. And well, I think this is the start of uh, further discussions. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone. Uh, our next Citywide Grand Rounds, we're going to take a break for the summer. It'll be in September with, with Dr. Lisa Andaman. So thank you. Take care. Have a good summer, everyone.